Thank you for joining us for another session of the ACM Hangouts hosted by Arts Council Malta. Here are some more details about today's session. Why should we target younger audiences in cultural programs? Why is this relevant in the long run? Are we doing enough to cater for young audiences and to ensure their engagement? In this session, we are discussing the relevance of considering young audiences as a main target audience for artistic projects and the process involved in creating work for young audiences. We will also be exploring the challenges which the sectors are currently facing in relation to the subject. So joining us for this session today are Denise Malholland, freelance director and educator, and Kate Fenechfield, learning and participation manager at Teatro Manuel. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. So my first question is, why is it relevant, why is it important to cater for young audiences, to create performances specifically for young audiences? I don't know. Denise, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think my experience, my whole life has been in theatre and it started when I was about six years old when Scottish Opera came to my school to do a workshop. Um, and it was Hansel and Gretel was the opera and we all got to play different parts within it. I got to be the witch, no surprise. And um, <laughs> I, I, we, they took us up to Glasgow after that to watch the show. And it was just, I mean, it was life changing. It absolutely was watching these people and thinking, well, you can do this for a living. You can actually, this is something you could do for a job. It was so inspiring. And if they hadn't come into the school, I'm not saying I wouldn't have discovered it at some point, but it opened my eyes to it at a very, very early age. And if you think about the these little sponges, these, these kids who are just waiting to soak up everything that you have, to expose them to things which are to do with the creativity, things like other than the academic subjects, which are fine, you know, they're great. That's a huge part of their life. But exposing them to music and drama and dance and other subjects, it's crucial for them I think not only in school obviously which I'm sure we'll talk about as well within the curriculum but then giving them the opportunity to go and watch performances which are tailored specifically for them mm -hmm. so they feel that they're really engaging with the artist they feel that they're getting something out of it and they feel like they're they're kind of being acknowledged somehow I think it's it's for me it's always been one of the most important things full stop Kate I'm going to be a bit of an echo um, <laughs> I have a, a, an interestingly similar experience, um, although not, not with a visiting company, but um, having grown up with an opera-loving family, so hearing it from a very young age um, in the house as a normal thing to listen to, just like pop was and musical theatre, um, being exposed to going to galleries, uh, just in general, like the artistic world around us. I think that I had that from my parents, really, um, and my family. But... Um, in my experience, uh, I came to it a lot later as an opera singer where I never, ever wanted to work with children. Yuck. And I, I went into an, an one of the... Uh, all opera companies do this now, but it was um, one of the first companies I worked for. And, yes, they wheeled us all out. Mm -hmm. It was part of our contract to do this, what I had considered to be a terrible thing, that I had to go and work in, with children. Mm -hmm. And, actually, once I got there... It was noted that I really was enjoying it. And then they invited me back to actually run a whole thing. And, and from there, the rest of my career has, has really gone from that. So, yes, it's when you, from whichever side, you see why it's important to and, and the impact it has on further, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But um, for me, young audiences, when you're creating something for young audiences and why it's important, it's because it isn't just about the thing they're seeing. It's about what you're letting their brains do mm -hmm. um, and but also the art in itself of course um, and then that bleeding into them maybe going and learning something that they're interested in whether it be that they take up you know acting or singing lessons or dancing or whatever um, to have that interest throughout their life and therefore that's a future audience and then it's cyclical mm -hmm. yeah so, so in reality, we are saying that this kind of impacts their possible direct engagement in the arts at a later stage. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but not just that, right? There are, and you did mention, Denise, other aspects that, that are going to help them. So, in, in all ways, all sort of manner of 
socialising and mm. interacting with people and developing empathy skills and mm. so many different things. Apart from the fact that even learning a musical instrument, um, I mean, I my family was not an artistic family at all, so you know, it was sort of, you know... Um, Scottish music playing ad nauseum because my father <laughs> listened to it all the time um, but you know I never went to the theatre We the, it wasn't part of my, my life so for me it was the school that really mm. introduced me to that we had an old piano and I was lucky enough to go to piano lessons at school because those were the olden days when <laughs> peripatetic teachers would come in and you would be given free music lessons so you could learn how to play an instrument and I tell you just from a cognitive point of view and from a coordination point of view, learning to play a musical instrument when you're young, learning to play the piano, two hands and feet, etc. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's mm. phenomenal, the skills that you're, you're giving children yeah. at a very, very early age. So it's about these well-rounded kids that you're producing. It's not only for those who may go on to become actors. Mm. You know, that's terrific, but the yeah. majority won't. But it gives them something else, especially, you know, this is a soapbox of mine and I do bang this drum a lot, but I just feel that kids... We're all stressed at the moment, but I think that children are far too stressed and should not be that stressed. Mm -hmm. And you see them when they come into their drama lessons or their music lessons mm. or their dance lessons. They're like creatures that have been set free. You know, they're, they're <laughs> running around having the most fantastic time because they're not sitting at a desk with a mask on. You know, it was given with everything that they've been dealing with these last couple of years. So, mm. you know, but even pre-pandemic, it was so important for them to have that opportunity to, you know, to just de-stress yeah yeah and when we mention young audiences because right before the session we were saying perhaps yeah. we should define young yeah. audiences a little bit the better e as well yeah the eu's definition of a young person which i think will please a lot of people mm -hmm. is the basically 30 is where, it, where you become like not okay, young anymore not which me, is so. great <laughs> for, it's great for youth <laughs> groups and for example youth opera i mean you know for opera singers definitely 30 that's great because that is still young um, so it's actually very encompassing. I think most people think youth is literally just as you end end 18 and then goodbye. Yes, we've finished mm -hmm. educating everybody. Um, so yeah, that it's that side of things. And it's it's having the mindset to, when you're creating programs, which you're obviously talking about, that you, yes, encompass what is in, perhaps in the sort of syllabi, if you, if you so wish to, uh, because it enhances what they're learning at school. And it's a kind of like handy extra tool. And they really retain stuff a lot better when they participate in, in, a, the in a theatrical performance or uh, something where they're going to it live. They're included. Um, and that's just fact. They, they do retain things a lot better when, for example, Shakespeare workshops. It really opens up because they're hearing it, they're, they're being asked to say things back, they're being asked questions about mm -hmm. it um, by the actors and becoming much more involved, it takes it off the page. This is very simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're planning for, let's say, babies, for example, so we have a little baby series, you've got to also remember the parents because they're of going, course. they're picking up the phone and booking for the first time with their little tot and they want the best for their child and mm. so that's very precious that first visit um so it's about also getting them as well because if you only cater mm. for the baby then you're not really making the parent understand what they could also go and back, do back at home yeah. with something very simple like playing the music back and and you know including music mm. or whatever we've done in the theater in fact i did want to ask a question about this kind of how do we how do we attract a young audience to um, a particular performance how do we engage them in in mm. the performance because um well usually it's it's an adult artistic mm. director deciding <laughs> what um what the target audience is going to be watching or mm. or should be watching so so how do we um attract and engage um these two levels mm. and that's something isn't it because again as kate was saying Often you, you can have the best programme in the world, but if the parents don't know about it and if they're not perhaps inclined to, mm. to bring the yeah. children to mm -hmm. watch, then you, you're missing out on a huge demographic as well. There'll be a, a, lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of children who won't get to see it, mm -hmm. um, who maybe won't even know it's happening. So again, I mean, my, I think for me, schools is, is the huge yeah. thing, going into schools, bringing the schools to the theatre. Mm -hmm encouraging them to and, and making sure that you are you know when the kids come to watch the zigzag shows um always you know 
I love watching them because for, I'd say, the majority of them, they have never been in a theatre before, ever. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful opportunity for them to actually set foot in a theatrical space and to watch a show. And then afterwards, you know, we see and we chat to the kids sometimes and things. And, you know, they just, <laughs> how do you learn all those words? And, and how does <laughs> this work? And, and, what, and, you know, there's etiquette and things involved as well. But you know, to be honest, you know, they have such a great time. And you hope then that if you get them like that, mm. that perhaps they will come back to something else. But the, this is like a fire that needs constant feeding. Mm. You know, you can't just give them one thing and then hope that that's going to be enough. You have <laughs> to keep you have to keep giving them things. You have mm. to keep showing them the opportunities. But how, how do you do that? As in, do you um, just propose a number of different programs? Um, do you reach out? Um, I don't know if it's the correct term here, but um, do, do you kind of, um, how do you communicate that to, to a young audience, especially a teen? age audience where we know that uh, there is some sort of gap mm. right in, in in audience following so I wonder what you yeah think the dreaded about teen audience <laughs> is, it's like the sort of gold you know you, you you really we strive for them because they are I mean going back to your point about being stressed none more so I think mm. than the teens yeah um, particularly 12 to 16 I would say um, they're you know they have a lot on um, and then they have all the extra stuff outside of school as well. And then we're saying, oh, but you also should try this too. Um, and so, yes, so it is tough. They're, they're definitely, I think, the hardest audience because if they haven't ha experienced the from young, from a young age, and therefore the parents, and indeed the schools, you're quite right, um, schools absolutely 100% are actually the top of the tree. Um, without schools and, and outreach and inviting schools, um, unfortunately, especially for obvious reasons because of the pandemic we have not been able to do it so there's a yep. huge dip so just to sort of talk about that just briefly it is a big uphill struggle mm -hmm. um so we need all schools and 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 you know there are people within each school that are really the ones who push for the the trips mm -hmm. and we need them to really now, okay it's right after the after, after the, the pandemic, pandemic and sorry yes yeah. after the pandemic and obviously we haven't been permitted to go into schools of because course. they stick to their bubbles and quite right um, so the only shows we've done have been with families. So that's sort of in my head. But of course, we're, we're constantly having that conversation about when can we come back? Um, and once that's the case where we can restart uh, that, then outreach is definitely, I think, the sure. most important thing. Because you. you can create a show for, in our case, it's mainly in our studio theatre, which is a black box theatre. Um, so it's a very intimate space, which is great for first experience because you're, you're really there. They can really see you and feel you and you're not this sort of person over in the stage far away. Um, but then those type of pieces can, can travel very easily. Um, and that's the, that's the goal, really, mm -hmm. um, to, to get into their faces and, and be with them and have that, them have the experience with the artists. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of demystifying it a little bit as well. You know, mm -hmm. you go into the schools and things, obviously, like culture pass and things, you know, mm. they, that was all going so well pre-pandemic. <laughs> and we were able to take operas into schools mm -hmm. and there were children's operas, you know, Little mm -hmm. Red Riding Hood, things like that, things which had been written specifically for young audiences with a lot of audience participation and things. Yep. Mm. But obviously, you know, we can't, we can't do that hopefully that will start opening up again mm -hmm. but you know those are the experiences that the, 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 the children need and not just the children the young people as well I would put into that mm -hmm. the, the, the teenagers as well yeah. mm -hmm. sometimes it's not practical for the schools to come to the theatre yes. we used to have that all the time because yes. then it's a logistically it's, there's a lot for them to think it's about <laughs> it's easier sometimes for the theatre to go to the school mm -hmm. you know, and sort of take a, a small scale touring production that can pop up anywhere and kind of show them that as well that it mm -hmm. can pop up and it doesn't need to be in a Mm -hmm. exactly. senior March theater, I, I so. think that links to what you say, like demystify this, mm. this idea of theatre, which is perhaps um, distant, is mm -hmm. not relevant to them, perhaps. Yeah, or so elitist in some or elitist, way, and things yes, like yes, that, yes. you know, and to sort of just make sure that they're having, they're having fun. But of course, a lot of it, again, like we said, the teaching in schools, you know, have giving them the drama lessons, giving them their music lessons mm. and continuing with those subjects you know, not sort of phasing them out when they start to get into their O-level years and, mm -hmm. you know, then they become the the term I hate most of anything where they start calling them soft subjects. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Putting them in a Because you just think, well, there's nothing nice soft about box. it. Yeah. You know, you want to come and try it. It's really, there's nothing soft. But, um, yeah, it's that sort of like, you know, giving them that as a continuing sort of ongoing stream of education. Mm. So, 
Yeah, for me, it's about getting into the schools. It's about more of these sort of culture pass type schemes because yeah. obviously in order to go into the schools, you have to be bringing in the artists. You want yeah. really good quality work going mm. into the schools and you want to make it so that there's something um, appealing to yeah. the creatives as well to, mm -hmm. to make this work to go in. I, I wonder what you think uh, of the local scene uh, in terms of what what is being offered for um, for young audiences at the moment. I know that we've been kind of going through a tough two years, but but what what do you think of of what's being offered at the moment? You're both very much involved <laughs> in this area, so mm, self I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a very Sometimes biased analysis, analysis of yes <laughs> shortcomings. No, I mean it's. Uh, so I, I can only speak on, on behalf of what uh, we're trying to achieve at Teatro Manuel, and that is essentially to cover a huge range of ages with lots of different projects. And that actually includes, but not for this conversation, but it actually includes um, the elderly as well, um, because th that's a, a separate thing, but I think important. Um, yeah, I think we have attempted to and and delivered in, in many aspects particularly because again because of the pandemic we we put a lot of our funding into the filming mm -hmm. um and i think that was seen from many other entities too um and creating work for film which massive learning curve for thea theater types because mm -hmm. we that's not our medium um so we, we did that and we, we collaborate with Zigu Zyg. Um, we've done two, two operas uh, for children with them um, on film. Um, I would say that it, it's obviously never the same. So f for us, it's so important that we do get back to or have some semblance of what we were doing before. Um, so very specific age structured pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be, for example, we did a, a show last weekend um, for uh, Carnival um, and particularly because there wasn't uh, anything happening here in the, the, the floats were there but it wasn't it's not the official Carnival um, and we felt like okay let's see if we can create a show about the history of Carnival and history shows I mean the top being probably anywhere, anyone's mind Hamilton something like that no, no we're not saying it was Hamilton but um, but bringing the children into the theatre and actually teaching them about the theatre the relevance of how that applies to Carnival all that sort of stuff yep. um, they are going to retain quite a lot of that and it was very fun and it was in the style of a panto mm -hmm. um, and panto of course we could go I could go on about that because I think that's probably most children's first experience exactly. really mm -hmm. because it's not seen as educational and therefore just for fun and most fabulous panto producers have crammed in quite a lot of cultural and historical and mm -hmm. so socio in information into yeah. into a panto so all of that um, and of course we we help produce uh, pantomimes at, at the theatre but but in terms of the broader structure of what we try to do, yes, it's the age ranges. Um, so trying to speak to those those different ages. The most popular used to be, um, we're hoping it will continue to be, the three to five-year-olds, um, because they haven't got the commitment of, of the school day mm. and, and the mums and dads course, can, the can, can come to those. For, so for that very popular. And of course, great age to get them as well yeah. and get them interested in coming. Yeah. So I, I wonder, I, I would just like to add to, add on to my previous question. So given the, that the rates for our audiences, like in normal audiences, uh, general audiences are quite poor, does it mean that we're failing at this level? Does it mean that um, we are kind of engaging young um, children and then losing them uh, along the way? What could that possibly mean? But um, I hate to sound like a like just you know like I'm just repeating, but I do think that the way that these subjects are tackled in schools, mm -hmm. I think the way that they're presented in schools, I think the way that the arts in general are presented is a huge thing because if it's seen as something which is a bit extra, if it's seen as something which is not a viable. Um, career choice, whether that is becoming a lighting designer or a costume designer or a set designer, you know, there are so many mm. aspects to it, which I think um, now 
I know they're starting to come in, for example, with the, um, the GCSE mm -hmm. uh, syllabus, you know, that they are starting to cover those things and they do have to sort of have a little look at different aspects of theatre, not just performing or, or writing, which is really good. But again, you have to get the kids to sign up to do the GCSE drama mm -hmm. theatre studies in the first place. And they're tiny classes. Sometimes it's, you know, sort of three or four. Some schools don't even run it because they just they don't have the, the numbers. So again, I think that if you are not showing them these as an alternative, if you're not exposing them to this within the school, not only as a trip once every term, yeah. but something which is happening weekly, weekly classes, mm. I think that I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I think it, it, that for me that's the biggest concern, and it's not just in Malta. This is in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Budget cuts, and of <laughs> course, you know, you cut back on the the peripatetic teaching, like we said, because it's expensive. Musical instruments are expensive. Musical training is expensive, all those things. So you know, I don't know, it's a really hard one to call because if we do engage them at three to five, then why aren't we still engaging them at 15? Mm -hmm. Is it just because they lose interest or is it because their days are so packed mm -hmm. with extra lessons and this and this and this that, I mean, obviously I'm very lucky. I work a lot with kids mm -hmm. who prioritize arts because they exactly. love it so yeah. i'm i can't tell you how lucky i am that i'm surrounded by sort of 13 to 20 year olds mm -hmm. whose lives are singing dancing acting musical instruments theater mm. youth theaters tmyt sopa youth company i mean they're everywhere so i'm very spoiled because i see them but i also do a lot of work with kids who don't have mm. that Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. would love to have that as well and those are the ones that you see sitting in the front row at zigzag with their mouths open mm -hmm. thinking yeah. what am i what am i watching yeah. you know so in answer to your question i think that yeah we are i mean i'm sure we're failing because i think you know we've probably always failed but that doesn't mean that we you know that we're going to continue to no, we just have to course. kind of look to the address future and this. think address this issue and is it purely because they are not given the encouragement that they need or the opportunities that they deserve when they're in school mm -hmm. and i really think they spend most of their life in school you yep. know this is the thing this is where they spend most of their day yeah, and uh, well, one final question because twenty minutes do like <laughs> go by really quickly. Um, so, in in the sense, what type of investment is needed now? Purely like more from the infrastructural perspective now, mm -hmm. rather than um, directly uh, from the the young audience. Um, but what what is the investment needed, and what does it take to engage perhaps more creatives to um, to engage in such work, to support such work, and to promote it as part of their um, their artistic work? Well, I think that it has to begin with the funding of mm -hmm. four. Uh, you know, you can't you can't run things without funding. So it's it starts there, but it also starts with, um, you know, still knocking on doors at the education ministry and continuing continually um, having that conversation about the, the benefits um, to to start projects within schools, let's say, you know, just as trials um, and to grow, grow from there. But you cannot run. I mean, Zigguzaig and Toy Toy mm -hmm. could not run without funding. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that that funding continues and grows. Um, and how we spend it, uh, you know, and, and how we, we basically look at each season and see where we need to find the gaps, fill the gaps. Um, but it, it, as, as Denise said, you know, if you're getting the three to five year olds, there's, you know, as for audience development purposes I'm talking about, you can't, uh, you, you need to, they need to continue to keep coming back. So you need to have that flow and that conversation back and forth. I think having a student councils and having students, um, you know, being involved, children being involved, whether it's with their parents and, and having those kind of focus groups is really a good idea as well, because yep. they're, they're giving you feedback instantly. They're your audience. Um, and they can say, oh, that bit was a bit boring or whatever. I mean, you know, we have to hear what they, they have to say. Um, but yeah, for me, I mean, it would start with the funding, funding for and sure. then from there. An opportunity, I yes. think, funding an opportunity, yes. because Zigazig is great, and I've done a lot of performances, I've mm -hmm. created a lot of performances for Zigazig. Um, I kind of wish it was, you know, I wish it was more. 
I mm -hmm. wish that it was it was more than once a year and I know they have their mm. season which is yep. excellent as well but it's kind of you know Kate knows this as well we bring on a lot of young artists who then go on to become creators in their own right mm. and then create direct produce what we're trying to shows do, yeah. of their own mm. you know so it's wonderful and there's all these you know the Manuel the mm -hmm. Salesians you know mm -hmm. we're bringing on all these young creatives but then they need somewhere they need they need someone mm. to say here's some funding here because it, it, often what happens you know we all know <laughs> you you get a budget and the budget goes for all the people that you're employing and mm -hmm. you you don't get paid mm -hmm. and yeah. that happens a lot and i see that a lot with younger creatives as well who yeah. will pay make sure that everyone else gets paid mm -hmm. and then they don't get anything themselves it's not practical and it's not sustainable it's encouraging and it's not encouraging and it's yeah. and it's you know it's not how it should be that's your that's your job that's mm -hmm. your career then you should be paid for that so obviously if there were more funds available hmm. more opportunities available you know then i think that would really help bring these new people mm -hmm. in, and existing and sort of you know obviously exactly. people who are very seasoned as well i think it would be very appealing for them mm. yeah. we don't want to take advantage of artists especially young artists we mm. want to um, show them that they are appreciated mm -hmm. and you know yes give by giving opportunity it's a, it's a great great buzzword but it's true it is an opportunity for them to spread their wings outside and and, and to try new things um and it's certainly for us it's the same i mean we, we we have a toy toy collective um which is which are the people whom are the people who have have learned with us in our training program and give those them the opportunity to also reach to the young youth for youth mm -hmm. audience yeah. it's really important Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much, Denise, for, for being here, for joining us today. Um, we have also spoken to artist Pierre Safrach from Teatro Anon about the process of creating a performance for, for a young audience, this time round from the artistic perspective. Teatro Anon presented The Little Prince in uh, the Festival Zygozaik in 2021. And this is what Pierre uh, shared with us about this process. Little Prince has, has always fascinated me. I, I read it a long time ago when I was uh, still a teenager. Um, but I rediscovered it when I, I had my daughter and I used to read it to her um, every evening. We used to read a piece. And as I, the more I read it, the more I realized that it was interesting for kids, but also much, much deeper. There's a really um, uh, much more to, to it. And it, it somehow made me think this could work in, in theater. And it had been an idea at the back of my mind, and it was something which then, as a, as a theatre and on, we decided to, to go for it with, uh, with Zygo Zeik. It is, it is a classic. For me, it's a classic, and that's why it remains relevant. It, it's a classic in the sense that it deals with, with themes which remain relevant, I think, you know, as long as we are human. It deals with love, with, with friendship, with loneliness, with loss. And these are, these are topics which, which we deal with as adults, but also as children. And yes, the, the impact is different, the reactions are different, but they are all very, very relevant. And the, the, the challenge was trying to find ways of, of adapting these themes to the wide audience, from children who are eight years upwards, this is what we, how we advertise it, from adults and children from eight years onwards, because it does appeal to, to everyone over that age. First decision which we actually took when, when we were um, building the, the, the production was that the prince would be a puppet. Um, first of all, none of us could really play the prince, and the prince himself is almost a mystical character, and having a puppet uh, somehow pushes more the imagination, especially of children, but also of adults. Somehow, you know, the, this wooden and, and, and um, you know, metal creature suddenly becomes alive. It, 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 and, and you give the life to that, um, to that inanimate object with your own life. So it becomes to you what you want it to be. And I think that is the importance of, of the puppet. Uh, then Chris uh, Gutt had this lovely vision of having um, uh, projections as part of the set. So that allowed us to, to have a lot of, of flexibility in how we presented it. Um, the script was, was adapted by, by Jess Camilleri from the, the book. And then we, we, uh, we improvised around this, how theater and on uh, works. We improvise 
we try different things and, and it develops um, as we go along. So yes, we had some clear directions, but then it developed far, far further than we actually thought we would actually go, including with the sort of flying aeroplane at the end. <laughs> As theatre and on, we, we believe that well, for us, theatre is, is about telling a story. Uh, yes, you have to keep the audience in mind, of course, uh, but it is about telling a story. And this particular story is, is well, quite difficult because it, it is, on the surface, a children's story, but really it goes much, much deeper than that. But although in that, case, in that sense it's difficult, it was also easy because we could adapt certain things for, for children. So, I don't know, the costumes, the scenery, um, some of the repetitions, uh, which were very, very appealing to, to children, and, and that kept them really interested. And we were almost surprised that, that for a whole hour, you know, the, the kids were, were really involved and, and enthusiastic about the production. But also the adults could, could relate to the story, to the words. And um, when it comes to, to telling the story, I think sometimes uh, telling the story to, to kids, I think the biggest mistake often is that we tend to downgrade the production. I think very often we underestimate the imagination of, of children and that they will understand much more than what they think they will. It's interesting because even, even uh, in Little Prince, the first few pages, uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry makes this big sort of contrast between children who are imaginative and who are not um, burdened by, by the rules and regulations of how we think against adults who want to put everything in a box. And, you know, we, we, we let the, the, the opportunity for children to use their imagination when it, come, when it came to Little Prince. And although, of course, we tried and we gave a lot of, of information about the characters, but there was a lot which they had to interpret. Now, probably their interpretation of the characters were, were different from what the, ad the adults did. One of the difficulties we had, for instance, was the, the tippler character, you know, uh, a person who's, who is drunk all the time. And we had a big debate, do we present this to, in a children's play? And we came to the conclusion, well, why not? You know, there are children who are in this situation, who have grown up in these unfortunate circumstances. Uh, we presented it in a way which was sort of funny, uh, which was musical, which was fun, but the hard reality of, of, of someone who, is, uh, who drinks because he's sad, but he's sad because he drinks, it is, is, I think, hit the adults, of course, much, much, much harder. We firmly believe in, in, uh, in, in young people coming to the theatre, and there's something, in fact, we've done other productions for Zuckerzeig because we, we really believe in it. Um, first of all, theatre is, is a live performance. Um, in, in a way, you know, comparing it to sports, you can go and watch a football match and, and it's live and you, you're just seeing, the, seeing it there, but the involvement is a bit is, is different. When you come to, to watch a production, again, you need to use your imagination, you know, um, and if we have a puppet who is not really a prince, but you have to believe that he's a prince, you have to believe that he's just come from a different planet, and that helps the, the imagination, it helps to develop your, your, your character as a person. And I think it, it helps to, to develop empathy. This is something which is sort of scientifically proven. It's not something which I am saying. It does, it does help empathy in children because they can see it. They can see a situation from different characters' viewpoints and they can see it happening in front of them. And it's, it's live. I mean, it, every show is, is unique. We had situations when uh, performances, when uh, one of the children just ran up, ran outside or started shouting and you know, we have to react to that as, as actors, and the reaction is always different depending on what is happening in the audience. And, you know, again, on our reaction, the audience also reacts uh, differently. So there's, there is this, this um, interaction, which really you get in no other way. I mean, you can play on a tablet or on a phone, and you're, you know, this is what we are competing against, competing against the movies. Um, and children there, yes, are seeing the story, they are seeing some fantastic special effects, but everything is, is fed to them. Here, you know, we had a projection of a planet, and the, the kids had to believe that they were in the planet, so they had to use their imagination. And I think this really helps them to develop. It helps them to develop a love for, well, for culture, for, for reading, for literature. 
I mean, it was it was great that after after the show, we were talking to to the children, and they came backstage and were playing with the prince, um, and we're talking. And it was great to hear that some of them told me, "I never read the book, but I want to go and read it." Oh, and the parents saying, "I'm going to buy them the book because they really enjoyed it." And that for for us was such such a great joy because it really showed that that it that the production worked on different levels on on appealing to to the children and to the to the adults who are also i think quite fascinated by by the story and by the production itself little prince is a book so we had to adapt it a little bit to make it to make it more theatrical so we had to uh, introduce antoine himself antoine de saint exupéry the, the, the author who became uh, the main character with with the prince and when again when reading the book we saw there are many many parallels between his life his real life and and the, the character in the book you know so his rose his wife he really had this relationship with her where you know he he was always traveling he was a great explorer and it was this sort of love meeting and disappearing and coming back and disappearing and in a way this is what the prince does he leaves the planet because of this rose, because he has this, she, she lied to him, he feels, but then at the end, he wants to go back to his planet because he wants to go back to his rose. And this, this relationship, which is in, in, in the book, really is, is, is so much part of, of what um, Antoine himself went through. And now they published some of his letters, which also shows uh, this, this love, which this incredible love, which there was between them, which, I think is reflected so so well in the, in the book, and hopefully it also came out in the production. Uh, this sort of complex relationship of of friendship and of love, where you you know, when um, when the prince saw those thousands of roses in 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 the garden, he said, you know, my rose isn't unique; she's one of a thousand. But then the fox told him, your rose is unique because she's yours, because you will love her, and that is something which. I think we all need to, to, to believe in, in our relationship with, with people. In this session, we also spoke to Marta Vella, who is the artistic director of Zigozaik, about the festival and its work in terms of creating and proposing works for young audiences, as well as its impacts and effects on the artistic community and audiences. Zigozaik has been with us for the past um, 12 years now. It's going to be its 12th edition this November. Um, I have been artistic director for the last two years, um, so it's been a bit of a baptism by fire for me because obviously my first edition was November 2020 and we all know what happened that year. Um, uh, however, the festival has been a staple in the Maltese cultural calendar for all really. Um, the festival's inception started because there was such a great need for work, for children, and um, young audiences specifically. Why is it important to create um, work uh, for this target audience? Um, the reasons are plenty, which I'm sure that my colleagues really went into today. Um, apart from, you know, uh, the importance of the arts, um, its educational ve value, um, how, uh, how it, you know, transforms um, children's imagination, um, there are many, many reasons. For me, what's incredibly special and um, something that's incredibly close to my heart, especially when it comes to the festival, is that um, we basically have the honour to be uh, the very first theatrical experience many of our audiences go to. Um, and I think that's, that's an incredibly wonderful thing. I think that, um, you know, to have an individual to say that the first time I went to the theater the first time I saw a show. Um, and obviously in true Zygozaic fashion, it will be um, a very quirky, creative, lovely, magical show, um, would be through the festival. Um, um, I think, I think that's, that's personally my favorite thing about, about the festival. And that's also what makes the festival so, so loved. Um, um, Inversely, you know, I think that um, children and young people as audiences are also very important for um, um, the artists themselves because they're the most genuine audience you can ever have. So um, 
you know, both positively and negatively, but then again, you know, um, you kind of get back whatever you dish out. So um, it's a bit of a, an open sort of Coliseum style, arena style um, energy when you're performing in front of kids, because obviously they're so genuine and they have no filter. So um, if they don't like your show, if they're bored, but they don't think you're good enough, um, they will let you know you know um and that's kind of how theater used to be so the normal conventions of theater what we what we understand you know is very rigid um and um, and well behaved you know etiquette of uh, being quiet being silent and not reacting and this is actually um, um kind of stemming from the victorian era when the monarchy started attending the theater so kind of the rowdy crowds were made to go silent and respect the sanctity of the theater before. It was very much of a back and forth sort of traffic. Um, and nowadays we only kind of have this experience in somewhere like um, a panto, where there's, you know, a lot of audience interaction. There's a lot of back and forth, the callback, you know, the traditional callback. Um, in fact, you know, uh, I always feel a little um, thrown off and a little discombobulated when, you know, schools come in and you have teachers and parents, you know, shushing um, children, obviously to be well behaved at the, at the theatre, of course. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that the spontaneity that, you know, children and young audiences are um, uh, is just something really, really magical and really special. Um, something we have also done this year as part of the Gozai, and we intend to always keep growing this base, is that um, we have had an accessible program uh, throughout. So we've had at least one performance, one relaxed performance of any production we had programmed for the festival. Um, um, this is something that's very close to our hearts and, you know, that we're very, very proud of. Um, uh, because within, you know, any audiences, apart from our mainstream audiences, there are audiences, there's a slice of our population um, that just has different needs. Um, and it is our duty as artists, it's our duty as theatre makers to um, provide this access, really. Um, and I think that that's what, that's what real inclusion is. Inclusion isn't tokenism. It isn't um, about creating something specific because um, real inclusion is that um, everyone in the audience has access and has, you know, the right to the same program. So um, that's also something that um, I think holistically really, really, really um, benefits all audiences, not just, you know, accessible audiences, but even having you know, schools and having uh, classrooms and kind of classmates share that experience together, watching, you know, um, a relaxed version of a show. Um, um, Zigozaig is in its 12th year now, as I said, and um, the last two years we've also worked on a digital program. Um, and this is still, you know, it's funny because it's still something very new, but it feels so old now because we've been living digitally over 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 the last two years, actually. Um, um, but that was also a very surprising hit um, because as much as we love art and we love live art, um, and you know we we want to move away from screens and we want to go back into the world. The truth is that, for example, for schools, when you have a live show in a, you know, 120 seater, that's basically accommodating, you know, four classrooms for one performance. Um, and with our digital program, we have now offered the same production um, to the whole year, to the whole school sometimes, you know. Um, uh, and um, obviously, you know, teachers and educators already have a very hard um, and difficult time of, um, of making things work that um, we, have to, we have to really um, uh, keep that focus. Um, and um, given, that, given that they have the flexibility of the work and given that they have the flexibility 
of um, having the program and sort of streaming it within their own classrooms, within their own timetable, without worrying too much about it. Um, that has that has also helped very much. Um, we actually hope as a festival to have more um, colleagues around us. Um, we've already sort of expanded um, a 10 day festival, which is, you know, very intensive, creative and dynamic um, week and a half into a season now, because obviously there was so much, um, so much demand from our audiences saying, oh my goodness, you know, it's so amazing to have 10 days of this. Can we please have more? So um, there's now a zigzag season spread over the year. Um, and we obviously just hope that um, we will increase this work because it's very popular, um, not just, you know, on this island, but it's also incredibly valuable for our young audiences. That brings today's session to a conclusion. I would like to thank all the participants for joining us today. We hope that this session was interesting, for you was engaging, and do feel free to leave comments um, in the comment section below if you have something to share about this specific subject. Thank you very much for following us, and we'll see you next month for another session of the ACM Hangouts.